Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's MitoAction monthly expert series. My name is Kyra Mann, CEO of MitoAction. Thank you for joining us for our presentation today with Jan Smiting, CEO of Chondrion, a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company discovering and developing therapies targeting mitochondrial disease. Today's presentation will be recorded and available on the MitoAction website in the coming days, as well as on our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. If you're joining us via phone, I would encourage you to follow along with the presentation slides that can be found on our website at www.mitoaction.org slash resources slash MILAS update. If you're joining us via computer, you should see the presentation on your screen. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation using the Q&A feature on the bottom menu bar of your screen. If you're calling in via phone, feel free to submit your questions to us by email at info at mitoaction.org, and we will get through as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. Jan Smiting obtained his training in pediatrics at the Radboud University Medical Center in the Netherlands, after which he completed a three-year training in metabolic disease at the Wilhelmina Children's Hospital in the Netherlands. From 1996 until May 2020, he was the head of the Department of Metabolic Diseases at the Radboud University Medical Center with a special interest in the study of mitochondria in health and disease. Since May 2020, he serves as the Chief Executive Officer of Chondrion. Professor Dr. Smiting has more than 25 years of experience in patient care, diagnostics, counseling, and research in the field of primary mitochondrial disease. In 1996, he founded the Radbound Center for Mitochondrial Medicine. He has initiated, supervised, and collaborated in many national and international research programs and has published over 400 peer-reviewed science articles, including in the New England Journal of Medicine, Science, Nature, Genetics, Cell Metabolism, the American Journal of Human Genetics, and Lancet Neurology. He has been invited to give more than 100 lectures, including many key lectures and seminars all over the world, and has organized key meetings and courses on mitochondrial medicine that significantly contribute to the continuing success of the field, include, including Euromit conferences, Frontiers in Bioenergetics, Systems Biology of Bioenergetics, and focused courses on mitochondrial medicine. Professor Dr. Smiting received the Princess Beatrix Foundation Jubilee Award in 2006 for his research in mitochondrial medicine and an honorary membership into the Pediatric Neurology Association of Hong Kong in 2011. He has given numerous interviews to national and international newspapers, radio stations, and television. From 2008 to 2014, he was director of the Institute of Genetic and Metabolic Disease, one of the leading research institutes of the Radboud University Medical Center. From 2010 to 2015, he was chairman of the Center for Systems Biology and Bioenergetics. Professor Dr. Smiting has obtained several major grants and was the coordinator of the six framework program, UMIDO Combat, funded by the European Commission and the ongoing con 2 Treat seventh framework program grant. Four of his former students have become full professors at international institutes while most others have enrolled in research, research staff positions. In October 2013, 2013, excuse me, he was awarded a membership of the Academia Europea. In April 2016, he was honored with a highly prestigious Knight in the Order of the Dutch Lion for his services to medical research. In September 2019, he was honored with the RCMM Achievement Award for his contributions to mitochondrial medicine. Professor Dr. Smiting has extensive collaborations with many, many mitochondrial patient organizations and researchers from all over the globe. He is founding CEO of the clinical stage pharmaceutical company Chondrion, which became fully operational in November 2012. The company's lead project 
Sanli Chrominal is currently in phase 2B and long-term open label extension studies in adults with MELOS spectrum disorders. Recently, the first children were enrolled in a phase two trial, and we look forward to hearing all about this study. So please join me in welcoming Professor Dr. Smiting. Thanks very much, uh, Kara. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's really a pleasure uh, meeting you and uh, 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 talking to you about Milo spectrum disorders and Sunday criminal. Uh, before uh, starting my presentation, I would like to show this, uh, this usual disclosure uh, slide stating that any forward looking statements represent our views only as of today. They should not be relied upon as representing our views as of any subsequent date. I would like to thank the organizers, uh, especially Kyra, uh, for giving me the opportunity to present. And the outline of my presentation is as follows. I will start with a very brief introduction of Condrion. Then I will continue on primary mitochondrial diseases focus on milo spectrum disorders, the topic of today, discussing the different phenotypes, the causes and the cellular consequences, and then move on to uh, the strategy we applied for developing uh, potentially new drugs. And finally, give you an update on the clinical trials we're running. So, Condion is, uh, is located in, uh, in Nijmegen, the Netherlands, uh, and at, at, which is at the, at the uh, close border to, uh, to Germany. It's in the eastern part of the country, and it's uh, easy, easy, reachable, uh, as you can see here, uh, with, with four different airports close by, uh, with, with distances from one to one and a half hour. The company was, uh, was founded in, in 2012, and recently, we moved to a new campus, the, the Noviotech campus in, in Nijmegen. And our labs and offices are situated in this beautiful M building. Uh, and from the start of the company, and that's not so surprising based on my background, the focus is fully devoted to contribute to the well being of patients with primary mitochondrial diseases. So what are primary mitochondrial diseases? Uh, well, primary mitochondrial diseases are diseases in which the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation system is hampered due to either nuclear or mitochondrial DNA mutations. The diseases have a prevalence in one in 5,000 live birds. On this slide, you see different, different cells depicted. The cytoplasm of the cells is in green, the nucleus of the cell is in blue, and contrary to what is normally presented in textbooks, uh, the mitochondria are not single organelles in the cell, uh, but form an intricate network spreading across the entire surface and, and body of the cell. These mitochondria here are depicted in, in red. And if you would zoom in, uh, to one mitochondria, you would see that it is an organelle with a so-called double membrane, an outer membrane, the outer mitochondrial membrane, an inner membrane, and between those membranes, an intermembrane space. This cartoon, which definitely not, not reflects reality, is show, also shows five uh, huge complexes. Complex one, complex two, three, four, and five together termed the oxidative phosphorylation system. And the oxidative phosphorylation system is the final biochemical pathway uh, for the production of the cells, energy, ATP. redox equivalents from, among others, the cytic acid cycle are oxidized at different parts of the oxidative phosphorylation system. 
this oxidation, for example, of NADH to NAD plus, leads to the release of electrons, which are transported through the chain to the final electron acceptor oxygen. During this electron transport, protons are pumped from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space. And when they are uh, returned via the uh, uh, ATP synthase, ATP is produced. So if this system is defective, it causes serious diseases. Diseases which can have their onset very at very young age, even immediately after birth, up to uh, late adulthood. As mitochondria are present in virtually every cells of the body, except the, the red blood cells, except the erythrocytes, any organ in principle can be affected. As the defects in the oxidative phosphorylation system are caused by either nuclear or mitochondrial DNA mutations, any mode of inheritance is possible. In case of nuclear DNA mutations, mostly we see autosomal recessive inheritance in which the recurrence risk is 25%, but also autosomal dominant and X-linked inheritance patterns uh, are, are, are known. In case of mutations in the mitochondrial DNA, in the mitochondrial genome, the inheritance is maternal, uh, meaning that uh, all children born out of an affected mother uh, can, be, can be diseased. As you all know, there's a great variety in clinical phenotypes, but even more important, there is a high unmet medical need for treatment development. So currently, there are more than 200 genes known, which, if mutated, might cause a defective oxidative phosphorylation system leading to primary mitochondrial disease. And the common consequences, the immediate consequences, and I will come back to that later in my presentation, of those mutations affecting the oxidative phosphorylation system are so-called reduction. giving rise to a certain form of cell death called ferroptosis due to uh, ROS-induced lipid peroxidation and inflammation due to an increased uh, prostaglandin E2. The most prototypic example of a mitochondrial disease in adulthood is are the so-called Mila spectrum disorders. Mila syndrome was first described by Pavlakis in 1984. Around six years later, uh, Goto uh, described the first mutation. And on this slide, you see the circular mitochondrial DNA in which uh, in the tRNA of leucine, in the transfer RNA of leucine, at a position 3243, there's a mutation and that mutation is the most frequently uh, seen mutation in, in Milos, uh, Milos syndrome. Based on the prevalence, the estimated patient number in, the U in Europe, the US, and Japan is, is uh, approximately 50,000 uh, patients. So, on this slide, you see the so-called transfer RNA of leucine. And at this, particular at this particular position, the an A is changed to a G, and that is the disease-causing mutation. The effect of this transfer RNA mutation is that different complexes of the oxidative phosphorylation system uh, are not built properly. And that leads to a certain phenotype. Contrary though to uh, what is uh, commonly 
uh, stated in this mutation, uh, the majority do not have classical Miller syndrome as described by Pavlakis. So classical Miller syndrome is mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis, and stroke-like episodes. But in the majority of patients with these mutations, we see other phenotypes, of which the most prominent one is the so-called MIDD syndrome, which stands for maternally inherited diabetes and deafness. And the other uh, common uh, uh, phenotypes are so, uh, we, we have called them uh, mixed phenotypes. So they consist of, of, the, of, of different uh, involvement of different organs. So at the Radboud Center for Mitochondrial Medicine, Paul de Laat, one of my PhD students, did a six-year natural history study of, uh, of, of this group of, uh, of patients. And the main message of this slide is that if you, for example, look at a certain moment in time at the current function, most of the patients have an involvement of either the nervous system or the muscle. Those are the organs which are most affected in this, uh, in this condition. Paul did also, uh, in his natural history study, follow-up data analysis. This is a very complicated slide in which on the x-axis, the H is depicted, and on the uh, i-axis, the uh, ANENDOS uh, score. ANENDOS stands for the Newcastle Mitochondrial Disease Adult Scale. And the higher this uh, number is, the worse is the condition. So what you see here is, for example, that this patient in a very short time frame uh, deteriorated, while others remain stable over years. And that is what we uh, also uh, see uh, in patients with classical Milo syndrome, the progression, those are the patients with strokes, the progression is much faster than in patients with MIDD, and those are much faster than in patients with so-called mixed phenotypes. So the question is, what, what are the factors, what are the circumstances which influence disease expression and severity? Again, here on this slide, you see that the transfer RNA and the mutation at this position gives rise to deficiencies of either complex one of the oxidative phosphorylation system or combinations of different complexes in which almost always complex one is also uh, defective. And factors related to the expression and severity of this deficiency and its consequences involved organ and tissue segregation and the so-called genetic bottleneck, the level of heteroplasmy, mitochondrial DNA copy number, cross-translational modifications, and some others. So what does this mean? Let me first concentrate on organ and tissue segregation and the genetic bottleneck. This slide, and this you, you, should, you should see as a female patient. And on the x-axis, development and aging is depicted, while on the y-axis, maternal inheritance across generation is shown. So during development and aging, the level of mitochondrial DNA heteroplasmy, which stands for uh, the existence of both mutated here in red and wild type mitochondrial DNA in one cell, uh, can change during life. And that change during life in, can be the so called relaxed replication, that's a continuous process, cell cycle independent 
in both non-dividing like uh, muscle cells and dividing cells or via so-called vegetative uh, segregation uh, which takes place in dividing cells where mitochondrial DNAs are partitioned during cell division. So this is, for example, a, a, an example of what can happen in postmetotic cells, for example, in the muscle. Uh, you start off with a few copies of mitochondrial DNA. Uh, during relaxed replication, the number of mutated copies increases. And when you pass a certain threshold, the cell will start to dysfunction. Here you see an example of so-called uh, vegetative uh, segregation in which during uh, uh, cell division, uh, the fate of the mutated DNA can either be existence or even disappearing. So these levels can change during life through these two mechanisms. Across generations, we have the so-called uh, genetic uh, bottleneck in which uh, the developing female germline is, is, is segregated with different proportions of mutated uh, DNA. So this is one factor with which uh, can give differences in the amount of mutated uh, mitochondrial DNA within a cell, within a tissue, within a body. I also mentioned to you the term heteroplasmy. Heteroplasmy means two or more mitochondrial DNA variants, including a wild type and mutant. Depending on the cell type, depending on the organ and depending on the ratio, between the wild type and the mutated type, uh, at a certain stage, a, the biochemical threshold is passed, and that leads to the oxidative phosphorylation uh, deficiency. Next to the fact uh, that uh, uh, the, the mitochondrial DNA is mutations, uh, also the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, copy number, the number of mitochondrial genomes per cell plays a role in the expression and the severity of diseases. So mitochondrial DNA copy number can be increased if you have more mitochondria per cell. So here you have uh, four mitochondria and here you have uh, uh, six, six mitochondria, uh, but can also be uh, uh, caused by the fact that you have more copies per mitochondria per cell. And what is known is that there is a relationship between copy number and severity. And for example, if you have a low mitochondrial DNA copy number in skeletal muscle of patients with the 3243 mutation, uh, we know that that is positively, positively associated with the disease burden. Finally, Another factor contributing to disease severity and expression are so-called cross-translational modification. This particular mutation at position 3243 uh, leads to a disappearance of another site, uh, the so-called so 5 taurine methyl iridine, the site for which taurine is the donor. And if due to this mutation, this site is Effective, that also induces impaired oxalose protein synthesis and or activity. And of course, there are different numerous factors uh, related to, uh, to disease expression and severity, including uh, the genetic makeup, environmental factors, and the age itself. So I talked about uh, MILAS, I talked about MILAS spectrum disorders, I talked about the uh, most common underlying mutation in the transfer RNA uh, of leucine, uh, leading to the oxos deficiency, either isolated complex 1 deficiency or combined complex 1 plus other deficiencies. But what are the common cellular consequences? Uh, 
Well, the immediate cellular consequences of uh, a defective oxidative phosphorylation are so-called reductive stress, the disturbed redox balance, oxidative stress leading to cell death and inflammation. On this slide, uh, you see the first complex of the oxidative phosphorylation system, complex one. Complex one uh, oxidizes NADH to NAD+. That gives rise to the release of electrons, which are transported via these so-called iron sulfur clusters to uh, coenzyme uh, uh, Q. During this transport, protons are transported from the mitochondrial matrix to the intermembrane space. And if, for whatever reason, this complex is defective, it leads immediately to both reductive distress as well as oxidative distress. Reductive distress, meaning an altered ratio of NADH to NAD+, having broad consequences on cell metabolism. Oxidative stress, meaning that the electrons which uh, escape from the complex uh, are the source of reactive oxygen species, including superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, which with their, uh, with their effects on, on cell function. So in the past, we, we looked at uh, complex one deficiencies and both reductive stress as well as, uh, as oxidative distress. Here you see a number of control uh, cell lines, and these are all patients with mutations leading to isolated complex one deficiencies. So the complex one activity is depicted here in the, cold, in the controls, normal activities, uh, while in the patients, uh, uh, all uh, activities are decreased. If you then look at the level of uh, NADH or NADPH uh, and compare controls to patients, you see that this, uh, that the concentration of that particular uh, redox equivalent is, is increased. Altering the ratio of NADH to NAD+, so increasing the ratio of NADH to NAD+, giving rise to oxidative stress. And these two markers are markers for oxidative stress. And you also see that in most of the patients, uh, this oxidative distress is present. When this, when this happens, it has a huge influence on cell metabolism, uh, but also, of course, on the, uh, on the mitochondria itself. In normal, healthy uh, fibroblasts, you see here these nice, this nice network of mitochondria, while in patient fibroblasts, of a patient with a complex one deficiency, this network is severely disturbed. So having collected a huge number of patients at the Radboud Center of Mitochondrial Medicine, uh, having collected cell lines of these patients, sh having showed that in these patients, with primary mitochondrial disease, reductive and oxidative distress are important disease-causing uh, mechanism, we started a drug development process. Initially, uh, in, 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 in direct collaboration with the Radboud Medical uh, Center and Combrion, uh, then a phase in which Combrion brought the initial ideas from head to lead to Sandy in and performing all kinds of preclinical studies in, in collaboration with, with various centers across the world. And then 
started the clinical trials. So how did we how we how did we do this? Uh, this in this slide, the, the strategy of our approach is uh, is briefly summarized. Uh, so we have observed that reductive and oxidative stress are main uh, contributors to to pathology. So we use these uh, uh, both these uh, uh, observations as as readouts. We used both uh, genetically and biochemically well characterized uh, patient cell lines and control cell lines, uh, measured uh, these readouts, and in an iterative process, tried to further improve the hit compound towards what it now is somnicorminol. And to do so, in this iterative process, we developed here it's stated 250, but it's now over 500 new chemical entities, uh, of which somnicorminol was selected, among others, based on pharmacological properties. In our preclinical research, and this is only one of the many experiments we, we performed, we looked, for example, at cell viability under so-called redox stress. And under these conditions, in healthy cell lines, cells remain viable, so are stress resistant. Patient cell lines though, whether it's MILAS or Li or LOM or other cell lines, when we apply a certain amount of a certain form of redox stress, these these uh, cell lines were stress irresistant. So not viable, they died. However, when we added in the same, in the same condition in these patients, solely chromanol, the cells survived. What we also observed that next to oxidative, stress, oxidative distress and reductive distress, uh, patient cell lines with, and here's an example of, of three complex one deficient uh, cell lines, show an increased concentration of an inflammatory uh, mediator called prostaglandin E2. And, and briefly, because this is all published, we were able uh, to normalize this increased PCE2 again with, uh, with zombie criminal. So in our preclinical research, we studied not only patient-derived fibroblasts, but also patient-derived induced pluripotent stem cell neurons and other uh, disease models like the NDUFS4 knockout model. The results obtained from this study were for us sufficient to uh, decide to move to the first studies in human. And that first study in human was a so-called phase one study in which we did both a single ascending dose study as well as a multiple ascending dose study. And the result of that study was that sonicorminol was well tolerated and had a pharmacokinetic profile supportive for a twice daily, twice daily 100 milligram oral dosing with a, safe, with a favorable safety profile. When we completed the phase one, we designed a phase two A study. And this slide shows, shows the strategy, clinical strategy applied so far. So this phase two A study was called the Kinesi study. That was a proof of concept trial, a signal seeking trial performed uh, at the Radboud Center for Mitochondrial Medicine. And this study was, like all our studies, a randomized double blind placebo control study. The study involved 18 adults with 
the 3242 mutation responsible for MELA spectrum disorders. The duration of the study was four weeks and the outcome measures were assessed after 28 days. So the conclusion of this first study in patients was that sonicrominol was well tolerated and safe. We tested multiple parameters and we found significant positive effects on several cognition related parameters like alertness, but also mood. These results let us design, let us to design the phase two B study called the Kenagize trial. This trial, which is currently ongoing, is a multi-center trial in four different centers performed in Nijmegen, in Munich, Germany, Newcastle, UK, and in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, which again is an RCT, but also includes the dose finding part. All patients will receive placebo and twice daily 50 milligram and twice daily 100 milligram in random order. This study, of which all patients have been enrolled, includes 27 adults, again with the 3243 mutation. But in this study, we also added a cognition related patient inclusion test. So we stratified the patients to a certain degree of cognitive problems. Again, this is a four week uh, study. And the goal of this study is to confirm the good safety profile, as well as the effects seen in various cognitive domains uh, and uh, in of the 2A uh, uh, study. And we have chosen one of the cognitive domains, the so-called visual identification test developed by Coxstate as our primary endpoint. In addition to that, also, uh, again, to as a, as a signal seeking uh, uh, part, we measure parameters in other domains, including hearing, migraine, and fatigue. Patients who have completed the phase 2B study are invited to participate to the open label extension study, the so called Kinerec study. This is an open label. Patients from the 2B will roll over. And this is an extension study with a duration of 12 months, in which the outcome measures will be assessed every three months. And the goal of this study is to establish longer term safety profile, gather additional longer term patient data across all phase 2B outcome measures, but also to assess complementary clinical outcome measures including several motor function related parameters. So with the phase 2B study, we hope to reconfirm the positive findings of the phase 2A in a larger patient pool. In the phase 2B, we manage patient heterogeneity with an inclusion criteria, and we added cognition endpoints validated in CNS indication. And all these three studies, the 2A study, the 2B study, and the open label extension study will create a valuable data package to optimize the phase three study design and further support discussions with regulators. So what are the take home messages? In the past 10 years, uh, the team made enormous progress. We developed a small molecule which can be considered as a pipeline, which has a pipeline in the product potential. So we all know that next to primary mitochondrial diseases, uh, the cellular consequences uh, are and have some similarity also in more common diseases and conditions. The compound has a triple mode of action. It's a reductive distress modulator, 
an oxidative distress modulator and has anti-inflammatory properties. In a phase one study and healthy volunteers, which was confirmed in the phase 2a study and also is still the case in ongoing clinical study, the compound is safe and well tolerated. It has excellent pharmacokinetic properties and importantly, it's able to cross the blood brain barrier. We have an extensive research program ongoing of which the results will become available in the year 2022, uh, at least for the phase 2b study and part of the uh, and part of the results of the open label study. Next to study in adults, which focus on brain in the 3243 mutation, we also recently initiated a phase one and two in children with primary mitochondrial disease, focusing on uh, motor dysfunction uh, especially. So in this study, we have already uh, had, uh, we have already uh, observed uh, that our predictions of the adult equivalent doses in the age ranges five to 17 years was correct. And the first patients have now been randomized in the phase two part of this clinical trial. And with that, I would like to cordially thank you for your attention and are open to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Smiting. We've had a couple of questions come in. Um, this is really exciting information for the PMM and MELOS communities. Um, first question is, is it possible to have MELOS even if genetic testing doesn't confirm your diagnosis? Um, so, so most of the, of the uh, uh, patients who have the clinical symptoms of MELOS uh, have the classical 3243 mutation, but also other uh, mutations in the mitochondrial genome, although very rare, might lead to this condition. And even uh, mutations in the nuclear genome might give rise to this particular uh, phenotype. And so, so based on that, and based on the fact that, that there, every year numerous new genes related to mitochondrial dysfunction and mutations there, therein are, uh, are found. Uh, yes, the answer is it's still possible, uh, depending also on, on the, uh, the in-depth, uh, how in-depth the uh, uh, genetic analysis has been performed. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And the next question is, is there a known threshold of heteroplasty plasmy when you start to see symptoms? And is there a way to test the level of heteroplasmy? And is that useful? Well, well the, 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 the problem is with, with uh, testing heteroplasmy, you can do that only in easy accessible tissues like, like body fluids or skin fibroblasts or more invasive skeletal muscle. Uh, and so, so for those tissues and cells, we, we know the level of, of, of atopus B. Uh, but the, the most important organ affected is the brain. And that is, of course, not, uh, uh, it's not doable to, to get brain biopsies and, and, and measure the level of, uh, of atopus B. In those in the in that particular uh, organ, uh, so it it the level of atherosclerosis in 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 tissues is depending on what tissue sometimes related to disease severity, uh, but in general uh, I would be very cautious with with the, with uh, uh, interpreting those uh, those relationships. Mm. Um, next question is, are there plans to potentially open sites in the U.S.? Yeah, there are absolutely plans, and we would love to do so. Uh, uh, but uh, first, uh, and, and uh, first, first, we will uh, see what the outcome of the phase 2B is. Uh, I expect the results uh, of, to, to be uh, available uh, by the end of, of Q3 
uh, this year. And based on those on the results, we will uh, definitely uh, uh, hope to to move as fast as possible to the US also. Wonderful. Next question is, how is the sound of Somnochromanol, that's a tongue twister for me. How is it administered? Liquid powder infusion? Yeah, it's 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 currently a, a powder to be dissolved in water. Okay. Okay. Uh, next question is you mentioned that there was signif significant cognitive effect of the somnochromanol. Can you explain how that was evaluated how that was evaluated and what improvements were seen? Yeah, the, so so uh, the uh, we we applied in that phase two A study three different uh, tests uh, for for mood and uh, and 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 cognition, uh, the uh, the uh, hospital anxiety and depression scale, the uh, back depression inventory, and and the functional test, which is called the test of attentional uh, performance, uh, and all those three tests showed. A significant uh, improvement, uh, and 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 we now know, and that comes also becomes also more and more uh, known, is that that uh, uh, defects in cognition are are much more common than initially thought in patients with uh, with with Milos. Uh, so any effect of whatever intervention. Uh, Definitely gives uh, gives uh, an improvement in the quality of life of uh, of patients. Absolutely. Um, next question is: You talked about um, a, an endpoint measurement as the visual identification test. Can you explain what what that is and what it's what what that endpoint measures? Yeah. So so um, the visual identification test is part of the so-called Coxtape test battery which is computerized uh, uh, testing. And the visual identification test, you have, you have uh, 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 two cards and they are uh, randomly uh, turned and, and you have to click uh, if you see a certain card appearing. Uh, so it measures the speed of attention. Uh, mm, okay. Interesting. Um, the last question that came in is, is it known how the drug works? What is the mode of action? Yeah, so, so, so the mode of action is that uh, it uh, has an, uh, it, it, so, so it is a, a reductive stress modulator, meaning that it uh, changes in the, in the good direction uh, the ratio of, of NADH to NAD plus via activation of a certain uh, uh, enzyme uh, uh, couple in the cell. Uh, so the thyroidoxin, pyridoxin enzyme machinery, that is with respect to, to the reductive distress. With respect to the oxidative distress, uh, one of the uh, properties of the compound is that it is a direct a scavenger of the reactive oxygen species. And the third mode of action is that this compound uh, uh, is a selective inhibitor of what is called the microsomal prostaglandin E synthase, and thereby uh, lowering the prostaglandin E concentration. Uh, and prostaglandin E2 is an inflammatory modulator. Uh, Thank you for so that. So it has a it has a triple mode of action, uh, which makes it rather unique, I would say. What and um, last question is: what What are the thoughts about moving forward with a study for PMN with adults? So, so we we decided uh, a couple of years ago to uh, focus on one mutation. Uh, in adults, and that was the 3243 mutation. Uh, one of the reasons was that a natural history study was ongoing uh, at the Radboud Center, where I was the head that time. Uh, uh, and secondly, because uh, it is one of the most frequent uh, mit primary mitochondrial diseases in adults. Mm -hmm. uh, but based on, on, on what we know uh, from the compound, what we know from 
the, the, the effect of the compound in, in different cell lines of other uh, mitochondrial DNA mutations, uh, the log a logical step would be to the moment we have uh, completed these studies and have started our studies also in the US to broaden uh, uh, it to other mitochondrial disease uh, uh, mutations. Mm -hmm. One step at a time. So other yeah, one step at a time. Yeah. <laughs> one step at a time. Well, um, Dr. Schmeiding, we are so incredibly grateful for you taking the time. I know it's late there where you are, um, but we're incredibly grateful for you taking the time to share the details of, of this therapy development uh, for the MILAS and PMM community. And you've had an incredibly long career in mitochondrial medicine, and we hope that you know how grateful we are to you for for focusing on this rare disease um, and supporting this community in all that you do. We truly appreciate that. Um, so I, want, I also want to um, encourage any of our attendees who are impacted by MILAS to join the MitoAction MILAS initiative with All Stripes. Through this program, All Stripes will attain, obtain your complete medical files, which are shared with you to have for your use and with your permission, all Stripes also provides a de-identified summary of your medical journey to clinicians and researchers, such as Dr. Schneiding, who are working to develop therapies and better understand knee loss. This is a really great way to obtain your comprehensive medical records, which you all know can be tiring and cumbersome to pull from all the different um, clinics and, and hospitals and institutions that you've been seen by, all the tests that have been run. Um, it's a great way to have someone else do the work for you and pull those records together that you have full access. And most importantly, it's an opportunity to take an active role in research. So to learn more, visit the MitoAction website and search, just search All Stripes, A-L-L-S-T-R-I-P-E-S, -L -L -E or feel free to reach out to a member of the MitoAction team and we can provide you with more information. As a reminder, today's presentation will be posted on our website for anyone who would like to list it again, share with others. And you can also find a full catalog of all of the expert series presentations on our website and on our podcast channels. Dr. Smiting, thank you again for joining us. We appreciate all of the information that you shared. We look forward to having you back um, in Q3 so that we can share the findings of the phase two study um, with the community. We thank each and every one of you for joining us for today's MitoAction monthly expert series. Have a wonderful weekend and we look forward to staying in touch. Until next time, thank you so much. Thank you very, thank you very much, bye.